I'm afraid all the time of the dark. Terrifying secrets can be buried deep inside. I start seeing fire. I start seeing people burning us up. But they don't stay buried forever. Don't you ever, ever tell this. That old goat, he's my second cousin. Everybody got something to hide. You can't talk about this. Keep your mouth shut. A famous enemy, a family connection, and a search for the truth that breaks down racial barriers and reveals how much we really have in common. I had to free my spirit from all the hatred and animosity that I held in my heart so that I could raise my children with no hate. This is a story about secrets, things that are hidden, things not spoken, not known, things denied, repressed or pushed back into the darkness of the mind's most hidden recesses, and other secrets so powerful they were used by one man to help build and then climb to the very pinnacle of one of the most powerful government agencies in the world, the FBI. The man was J. Edgar Hoover, and his meteoric rise to power was built on the secrets of others. Secrets he kept close in hidden files and dossiers. Secrets that could destroy lives, topple fortunes, and rip families apart. But J. Edgar Hoover himself harbored some deep, dark secrets. Deceptions he kept covered up until the day he died. One was a 300-year-old family secret that traced back to a humble Mississippi town. But one woman's search for healing and the truth finally uncovered Hoover's biggest secret, still hidden more than three decades after his death. It was a secret he thought no one else knew. Yet a young black girl in 1950s Mississippi had heard his subterranean secret and she'd known about it all her life. Only she couldn't remember it because it was buried in her subconscious mind, repressed due to the trauma she underwent on the day it was revealed to her. The year was 1957, and the young girl was 10-year-old Mildred McGee, living in a government project in Macomb, Mississippi. It began with an argument in history class about a man nobody in Mildred's world liked. She was prepared for the lesson that day, not for the upheaval it would cause in the course of her life. Jagger Hoover is the president. Aww. What's wrong with you? That Hoover man is in the FBI, and he is not. A president. We are setting U.S. presidents like Abraham Lincoln. Ooh. Judas, we got to stop this argument. And just to be clear on the subject between the two of you, J. Edgar Hoover is not and has never been the president of the United States. So can we please move on to the subject we're studying today, United States presidents. Mildred was feeling satisfied with herself as the squabble ended. And knowing her oral family history, she could hardly wait to get home and ask her father to take her to see her maternal grandfather, whom she called Big Daddy, so she could ask him about the Hoover she'd heard were in her family. The upcoming visit with her Big Daddy was about to change young Mildred's life, and not for the better. What would be revealed to her that day on the porch of Big Daddy's home nearly destroyed her because of the secret she was forced to keep from that day forward, the same secret J. Edgar Hoover was forced to keep his entire life. Starting from the traumatic moment, it was revealed to him as a young man. A secret that damaged both their lives and ultimately the lives of countless people of color in America. A secret that would put J. Edgar and little Mildred on a collision course that wouldn't connect until almost a quarter century after his death, when she was all grown up and having problems. On that fateful day 40 years prior, she sensed the man in her family named Hoover was not a subject that was talked about openly. So she approached her big daddy gingerly. Hello, daughter. Hello, big daddy. Big daddy, is that Hoover man related to us? That old goat, he's my second cousin. Wow, he's an important man. What's that Keep your mouth shut. That man doesn't want to be part of our family. Don't you ever, ever tell this. How they'll burn us while we sleep. Mildred had noticed the fear in her Big Daddy's eyes, and this terrified her. 
But as scared as she was, she was an inquisitive child, so she returned to press the issue further. But Big Daddy, he can't hide who he is. He gotta have a birth record. Everybody got a birth certificate. No one will ever find one. He'll destroy all the files connecting himself to this family. I believe he's already done it. Go on, get, 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 go play, Millie. I don't know, Clint. I, I, I just don't get a good feeling about it. What's the truth? Now, you finna bring some trouble up in here now with those loose lips. Now, Clint, stop leaving it alone. Everybody got something to hide. One day all these bones will come out the closet. Little Mildred changed that day from a bright, outgoing child to a shy, introverted, scared little girl. And from that moment on, her interest in her family's oral history waned. Yes, that old goat was my second cousin. He didn't tell me how that old goat was his second cousin. He just said that old goat is my second cousin. And I say, wow, I'm 10 years old. Where do I go back and tell my class? Wait, daughter, you cannot do that. Why? Because that is a powerful man. And that man doesn't want anybody to know he's a part of us. I'm 10 years old. I don't understand this. Why, why not? Because he could have us all killed as we sleep. Think about a child, all killed as we sleep. I got to go to sleep in the dark. And this man is going to come in the dark. And he's going to burn us all up. Not only me, my whole family. I've got to protect my family. I go to my room and I cry all night, and I cry out to God, and I beg him to take that memory away so I won't talk, because I don't want to tell. God, I don't want to tell, because I don't want them to burn up my family. And I wake up the next morning, and I have no memory of J. Edgar Hoover. Repression is one of a number of defense mechanisms which are utilized by all of us to some degree in order to keep functioning. And in repression, something that is extremely traumatic is just too much for a person to handle. And so their psyche just automatically puts it away, like it's gone, like it doesn't exist. The unfortunate thing, of course, is that because something's repressed doesn't mean it has no effect. Years go on, family gatherings, the stories of Mama Emily, all the Hoover children, the babies comes up. And I find myself not wanting to be interested. Why? That little girl is inside of this body now. Don't talk about that. And as I grow, I'm, I'm afraid all the time of the dark. I start having dreams. I start seeing fire. I start seeing people burning us up. Now I'm locked in to this body, and I'm trying to get out. When a child is told, something about the family that then they are told to keep a secret it's very traumatic for a child most of us don't keep secrets well but children particularly don't so they have to work very hard at keeping the secret and one of the things they develop besides um, the tr lack of trust and fear of intimacy and pro possibly depression and possibly low self-esteem is fear of annihilation some of those feelings continue in adulthood and yet they don't know why. They feel uncomfortable if they've had to keep a secret and their secret is repressed, then they don't know they're keeping a secret. But they do know that for some reason they don't necessarily feel like the rest of the kids. Sometimes they feel like they don't fit in. Even when I, at 10 years old, when my grandfather said, daughter, you can't do that, he said because that man does not want to be a part of us. That man wants to be passing for white. And so then he went on to scare me so badly and tell me that he would kill us all. He would have us all burned up. And he had the power. And he had the power. And that's what he said. He said.
the power to eliminate all of us. And learning that the all-powerful J. Edgar Hoover was related to her was only part of Millie's mysterious family secret. The rest involved close relationships forged in the dark generations ago. Sexual relationships that complicated current relationships on her family tree. Passionate pairings from the past leading to a practice called passing for white that was much more prevalent across the country than anyone ever realized. Passing, as I remember as a kid, is that when you were a black individual, African-American person that had very fair skin, blue eyes or green eyes, pretty straight hair, you could say I'm black or I am white. Well, passing is a term usually for a very, very light person like myself, a light person who feels that they're going to be hemmed back or kept back because of their nationality, their race, or whatever else, and they want to better, better themselves. So it's easy to say, well, I'm the one that's being recognized as being well, the legitimate race at the time, and say, okay, I passed it, I'm part, I'm part of that group. And on Millie's mother's side, many of the relatives were light-skinned. When I would go out to school to see how my children were coming along, and my kids would and they introduced us to the teachers. The teachers were white, and they told my daughter, said, she's not black. I said, what am I now? In fact, the higher up the family tree you travel, the whiter the leaves look. When I saw my grandmother, and when she left, that was back in the halls in the days, where they, that's the only kind of transportation they had. And uh, when, he, when they left, I said, Dad, I said, she's just as white as any of the rest of the white people. I asked first. A lot of my people pass for white. I believe that in my heart. But that's their desire. And I believe when it happened, if I had been born, I would have passed for white. And I love my, being a black woman. I do. But in 1893, I'd have jumped through the back door and come out the front white in a heartbeat. Back in the days of slavery and the many years of economic oppression that followed, it's understandable why it was done. Yet passing for white was ultimately a deception, a lie. And if the truth can set you free, Millie sure needed to find it. I'm hurting so bad inside because all these years I've had this dream. And I know in my heart and in my subconscious mind it meant something. But I was afraid to say it, but I knew. Oh yeah, I knew. And when I found it and I saw it, I began to feel free. Everything just moved off of me. It was just like uncovering a veil off my face. And I was anew. And I know that my husband can see it, my mother can see it. You know what my mother said to me? She said, daughter, I've never said this to any one of my children. She said, but you are the chosen one. She said, you are the chosen one. I said, mother, why me? She said, I should have always known it because out of all my children, you were the most nosy one. Millie's path to wholeness had begun with her writing and it continued in conversations with her mother. So when I talked to my mother, she, she started talking about uh, the Hoovers. And then I asked her, does, does a man named J. Edgar Hoover ring a bell to you? And she was like, shh, shh, you can't tell that. You can't tell, there's two murders, two murders. And I'm trying to follow her. What has the two murders got to do with Big Daddy telling me this old goat was his second cousin, but Big Daddy also told me we could all be killed as we sleep. And I'm thinking, well, I didn't tell it. All these years, I didn't tell it. So why is two murders? Who was murdered? And my mother started to tell me that it was a family secret and an example made in the family. My mother said, are you sitting down? And I said, okay, I'm sitting down. What is it? She said, Ken just told me that Uncle Ivy, her grandfather, was J. Edgar Hoover's biological father and I said what do you mean but actually she said outside child was Uncle Ivy's outside child because Uncle Ivy was married 
So I sort of explained ass like child to me because I, I think I knew because I heard it back in the South, but I asked her to explain anyway. She said that meant that Uncle Ivy had a wife and he had a, a mistress as well. And he got the mistress pregnant and the mistress had the baby. And J. Edgar Hoover was not Millie's grandfather's second cousin. He was actually his first cousin. Because just like any uncle, Uncle Ivy was Big Daddy's father's brother. For Ivory and Big Daddy's father, William, were blood brothers, even though they had two different last names, Alan and Hoover. Which made the task of untangling Ivy from the family tree even more difficult. The unraveling began in 1990 when Millie first entered therapy. By 1996, with her repressed memories recovered, Millie set out to record her oral family history in a book called J. Edgar Hoover, Passing for White? Question mark. The book was eventually completed and published in 2000, which was no small feat, considering Millie had graduated from the all-black Berglund High School in Macomb, Mississippi, illiterate. When I started to write this book, it was about my family, but it turned out to be much bigger than that. Years of resolute research and doggedly determined digging, Millie was finally able to confirm her family's connection to J. Edgar Hoover. Ivy Hoover was here. And William Allen was here. It was a tireless task she started in Salt Lake City, where the world's largest collection of genealogical material is preserved. With hard work and hired help from a couple of genealogists, Millie set out to document her family's oral history. First thing, we have that, that, that oral history, which I think needs to be really carefully looked at. Especially in black families, where there was so much illiteracy, oral history is a very important part of our black family history. Um, you can't discount it. You have to take it, take it and then work with it. But black oral family history, you know, Alex Haley showed the importance of this in his work. Black oral family history is very, very important, uh, much more than in white genealogy. It took a long time before historians decided to accept oral history as being factual, because now you can document through documents of the slave owner in a formal record that was actually verbally given to somebody years ago. And you can match them up and say they are the same. African American traditional oral history is very important, just as important as documents. So I went on a mission when I finally realized that I had a chance to do genealogy on my family because I want to move back to what my grandfather said yes. when I went to him and I said, why would he try to hide who he is? I said, Big Daddy, we could find his birth records. Big Daddy looked at me and he said, look, daughter, you won't find it. You could go looking all you want, you will not find it, he said, because it's already erased. He said he's gotten rid of it, he's already getting rid of who we are in the connection with him. My grandfather told me, and what I'm saying, why I'm telling you that is because when I went looking, I found that. I found exactly what my grandfather told me. We found documents that was erased, smeared, changed. I decided that this one document proves that my grandfather's oral history matches a document. The first anomaly in Hoover's birth record was that it wasn't even filed until September of 1938 when he was 43 years old. By then he'd held the top spot at the FBI for 14 years, yet he'd never applied for or filed a birth certificate, even though they're a prerequisite to being hired by the FBI. The process was fairly simple. We filled out an application, sat back, and waited for the FBI to do complete background investigation. As far as I know, everybody, or every FBI agent had a birth certificate recorded properly, and you could go there and check it out. So why did Hoover wait until 1938 to finally obtain his birth certificate? Could it have been because his mother died in February of that same year? And after her death, Hoover's older brother Dickerson signed before a notary that he was present and 15 years old at the time of J. Edgar Hoover's home birth. It would seem that Hoover's mother, rather than his teenaged brother, would have made a far better witness to his birth. And Hoover's own autobiographical account states that he was born at home in Washington, D.C. with a physician named Dr. Mallon in attendance.
However, despite the fact that it was legally required to report a birth to the health department and that this had been done for the first two children born in the family, there was no certificate of birth filed for J. Edgar. Additionally, the entry for John Edgar in the DC index of births is smudged and written in different pen and style, clearly added at a much later date with the certificate number out of order and containing the suffix D, indicating a delayed filing. Oh, there's no doubt in my mind that, that the records surrounding Jagger Hoover seem very suspicious. There's no doubt about it. There were a lot of records that were actually smudged, different handwritings, different formats on the documents. They had to white out and then try to rewrote over it. And when Hoover finally filed his birth certificate, he also submitted a letter from his church certifying his baptismal record. The letter gives his birth date as June 1, 1895 with a J-A-N for January written over the June in noticeably different handwriting. And the baptismal record itself lists Hoover's birth date as the 1st of June, not January. Even more curious is the fact that Hoover wasn't baptized until he was 13 years old, when the various churches his family frequented all practiced infant baptism. And though Millie wasn't the first to notice these document discrepancies, she was certainly the first daring enough to discuss them openly. I had suspicions when I was a brand new agent that he might possibly have some black blood because one of my jobs in investigating uh, applicant cases, we always check birth records and educational records, and death certificates, just, you know, we're always in the clerk's office, county clerk's office, mm -hmm. reviewing records. And there were a couple friends who did this routinely in, in Washington, D.C. They checked applicants. And I talked to one of them one time, and he said, you know, just for the fun of it, uh, I tried to find Hoover's birth record, and there's something wrong with it. <laughs> and I said, oh? I said, yeah, I thought you'd be able to go all the way back to Europe with his record. No. And he was telling me about it. And he found some rather strange things, like the there were some things that were erased, dates were changed, and, and uh, the filings. And I thought, hmm, that's weird. Weird as it was, it didn't really surprise the few FBI agents who found out about it, for it only confirmed what they'd long suspected. There were rumors uh, among agents who were friendly that Hoover might have some black blood because of his short, cropped hair. Some agents just flat out said, I think he's part black. And that takes a lot of courage because you never know who's listening. You know, some submarine in the office would send a letter off to Hoover. And agents also thinks you're part black. You're gone. And Millie's research revealed even more evidence that Hoover had been living a lie not only in claiming to be Caucasian, but also in hiding the fact that he was illegitimate, an outside child, as the oral story stated. And incredibly, documentation of this was found on the application filled out in 1938. On the application it says, if you are legitimate or not, it says check yes or no. Are you legitimate? And, he ch and the, whoever checked it checked no. Oral history is crucial in black genealogy because with illiteracy and slave trading, Slaves had no other way to keep track of their relatives, who were often sold and whose names were sometimes changed at the will of the new slave owners. My thing was, since white America says that our oral stories, our grandparents sit up and lie to us, or it's just rumors, I wanted to prove it. I set out on a mission to prove that oral history is just as strong, or even probably better, than documented history. Like many descendants of slaves, Millie's oral family tradition traced all the way back to Africa, and the story was oft repeated as it was passed around campfires, hearths, porches, and family gatherings from generation to generation, that there were three very tenacious women in the Allen ancestry leading the lineage through and out of slavery. The first was a young woman known to the family only as Grandmama Elizabeth's mother who was taken at 16 years of age from Africa 
to America where she was impregnated by her slave master, a powerful politician and preacher named Christian Hoover. When her baby was born, it was said the beautiful half-white baby slave girl was named Elizabeth Allen. Elizabeth Allen was also impregnated at a young age by her father, the slave owner, and she gave birth to a beautiful mixed-race baby girl named Emily Allen. This complicated things considerably since it made Emily both daughter and granddaughter of the slave owner, Christian Hoover. This is very bizarre, and it's, and it's hard to explain because it's like a, a web. Now, let me explain it to you. Christian Hoover, who was born in 1796, who was a senator, a state legislator, and a minister in Macomb, very well-known man, was married to a white woman by the name of Mary. He had a son. He had two sons. We're going to talk about the two sons that connected to my family. He had a son by the name of William Hoover, who was born in 1832, and he had a son by the name of Christian, who he named after himself, but his nickname was Kit, Christian Kit, who was born in 1840, and he had Emily, who is my great-great-grandmother, who was born in 1840 by his slave uh, that he owned, Elizabeth who was born in 1814. Christian and William came from the white wife. Emily came from the slave girl. According to the oral history, Millie's great-great-grandmother Emily was left behind with her slave master father slash grandfather and her white half-brothers and sisters when her mother Elizabeth met and fell in love with another family member named William Hoover, who also impregnated her with a baby they named John Hoover. After giving birth to Emily's half-brother John, Elizabeth left with the baby and his father heading for the Maryland, Washington, D.C. area where they married and she passed for white her entire life. Meanwhile, back in Mississippi, Elizabeth's daughter Emily was having lots of babies with her white half-brothers, Christian Kit and William, starting when she was only 19 years old. Emily had eight children in all and the first one was fathered by her half-brother, Christian Kit Hoover. Christian Kitt, uh, the white son of Christian Hoover, got in bed with his half-sister, Emily, and from that, they had a son, and that son is Ivory Hoover. Next, Emily had a baby girl fathered by another white plantation owner named F. Macomb. After that, she birthed six more babies, all with the same father, William, who happened to be one of her other white half-brothers, the one she would later be willed to. Christian Hoover, the slave owner, willed Emily, his daughter, to his son, William Hoover, born 1832, and he was married. He had a white wife named Martha, and then he proceeded to have babies with Martha, his wife, and and the slave, which was his sister, and they had six children together. Back in the days of slavery and before birth control, it was not uncommon for women, both black and white, to birth a baby every year or two. It wasn't talked about openly, but it was likewise not unusual for slave owners to have babies every year or so, not just with their wives, but also with select slave women they called bed warmers. It, that's, that's a secret that they were having sex with relatives. And under the one-drop racist rule, the mixed-race children that resulted were legally considered black, no matter how white they appeared. And life for them was not necessarily easy. On one hand, they say white people don't want them. And on the other hand, darker black-skinned folk are jealous of them. And that goes back to the, in the big house, you know, the lighter skinned ones got in the big house so they had better food sometimes, where the darker skinned ones were working out in the field all the time. And those who opted to pass for white or had it forced upon them, as we shall see in J. Edgar Hoover's case, had it even rougher. I think it's deadly. I think it's a deadly uh, situation because if you were passing, you had to make sure they didn't know, and sometimes you had to make sure they didn't know. You know people actually cut themselves off totally from their family to just create a whole new identity. Of course, the bed warmer practice that started it all worked only in favor of the white men. The slave women had to submit to their masters, but God helped the black male who even dared to look at a white woman. 
The cops, the courts, and the KKK enforced the rules, and people who stepped out of line were punished severely, both black and white. Oh, man. <laughs> I was threatened many times by them. Uh, Ku Klux Klan was just a group of white people that wore masses and their white, white robe, and they carried a Bible with them, just like, you know, but they would harass you. Well, I seen them at night when they would come down. It's like when the some of the black people belonged to NACP, they would get them and try to kill them. A lot of them, I found out after they got the mass on, downtown shopping and in grocery stores and all that kind of stuff, they were some of the same people. Same people had the mass on. They'd be downtown selling your stuff, owner stores and all that kind of stuff. Everyone, it seems, was in on the system designed to keep the status quo. Bed warmers were one thing, but falling in love with a slave woman was not even close to being acceptable. Which is why the love affair between Millie's great-great-grandmother, Emily, and her white half-brother, William, was never made official, even though their relationship carried on to his death long after his white wife, Martha, divorced him. And Millie's research turned up the documents that proved it. Well, there were census records. There were these records because African Americans up until the early 1900s didn't have records of their own. All of it had to be part of the master's records, the plantation records. Since slavery was abolished in the middle of Emily's childbearing years, Millie hoped the births of her eight babies would be recorded. But the genealogist she hired found much more. I had just paid him to find the documents because I, call, I remember calling him after I talked to my mother, and I said, my God, I want to match this. I said, I should be able to find eight children born by my great-great-grandmother, by the Hoover master. I should be able to find that. Mm -hmm. And I said, and one child named Ivy Hoover. That should be able to be in the record somewhere. Right. He said that he was so inquisitive about that, that story that Jagger Hoover was my grandfather's second cousin, he wanted to find, and he went on his own before I paid him for five hours in the archives and found Emily Allen, Mother Elizabeth Allen, Emily Allen married, it says married in the census, to William Hoover and had all these babies and one named Ivy. That was the smoking gun as far as Millie was concerned. It proved her great-great-grandmother, who never married yet had eight babies, was more than just a bed warmer to William Hoover. She was family. And there she was in that house, but she was owned by them. And she was in her own area. But somehow, the record stated that she was married because all these babies were Hoover babies. I'll be more than a while. Uh, my grandfather, Alan, and Uncle Adam and Hoover, I asked about that. It was fascinating to me at one point and then sad. I felt sad because it caused my mother to be my cousin. And of Emily's eight children, Ivy was the only one given the Hoover surname. But it wasn't until Millie went to Mississippi that she would discover a possible reason why. Lord have mercy. There he is. Ivory Hoover, husband of Ari Hoover. I can see it right there. Ivy, and he spells it I-V-E-R-Y. That's what we thought. Ivy, H-O-O-V-E-R, Hoover. Husband, Ari, A-R-Y. See, that's what she's spelling it. Ari Hoover. What's that? November 24th, 1859. Oh, yeah, almost on my birthday. At the gravesite, Millie noticed Ivory Hoover was born on November 24th, 1859, only one day before her own birthday of November 25th, 1947, and she noticed something else. Now, check this out. Ivory Hoover was born November 24th, 1859. Christian Hoover laying here was born November 24th. Well, he's, he's the grandfather. I know, I'm just, I'm just showing you the date, his birthday. Right. They, they was born on the same birthday. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. That's, that's what I'm saying. Look yeah, at that. Born. Can you believe that? Now, wait, check this out. I was born November 25th. <laughs> Turns out, Ivory Hoover, the first baby born to Christian Sr.'s daughter-slash-granddaughter Emily, 
was born on the old slave master's birthday, fathered by his own son, Christian Kit Hoover. So what's interesting here, Ivy was born in, in 1859 and would have been nine years old when Christian died. So he would have known little Ivy, who was very fair skinned, almost of past course. his white, with blue eyes. He would have known this grandchild. That's right. And when little light-skinned Ivory was born, he had family ties to his grandfather in more ways than just being born on the same birthday. He was Christian Sr.'s grandson through both parents because Emily and her half-brother Christian Kit were both children of the slave master, making him Ivy's maternal as well as paternal grandfather. And since Emily was born a daughter and granddaughter to Christian Hoover, Ivy was a grandson slash great-grandson through her. And after only a few decades with different surnames and ever-widening differences in skin color, Emily's descendants didn't even recognize that they'd come from the same family, which is why Millie was shocked to receive an email from a long-lost white relative named Christy Hoover Sullivan. The email began, To Millie L. McGee, if your research is accurate, then we're cousins. Christy's family had been doing their own genealogical research on J. Edgar Hoover, because he claimed her great-great-great-grandmother, Elizabeth A. Hoover, as his grandmother. And Christie's family always attached a disclaimer, we claim no relation to J. Edgar Hoover because they were ashamed and embarrassed at his bigotry and abuse of power. Yet they were curious because as children, whenever they asked about J. Edgar, their aunt, just like Millie's grandfather, would only say, Don't dig too deeply, or you'll uncover the skeletons in our family closet. Nevertheless, Christy and her family searched for information on Elizabeth A. Hoover, their supposedly shared relative with J. Edgar Hoover. And surprisingly, they couldn't find any records to document her. Of course, had she been born a slave, this would have made sense, since slave births were not recorded. And it wasn't until Christy read Millie's book that she started to understand the missing links in her family's lineage. And when it came to Emily's firstborn, Ivory, there was a huge mystery surrounding what happened to him. For he showed up in the 1900 census married to a wife named Airy in Macomb, Mississippi. But by the 1910 census, he showed up listed as married to a woman named Annie. After that, he just disappeared. There were no articles in the papers, no death records, no obits, no divorce records, no indication at all of what had happened to him, only that his wife, Airy, had married someone new in 1918. It wasn't until Millie went digging in a secluded graveyard on the old Hoover plantation that she would solve the mystery. <laughs> oh my god! This is awesome! So anyway... Now we know. Died November... Is that November? Wow! November what? 18... 1917. And I... I found him all the way up to 1910. We looked everywhere, everywhere, could not find what happened to him, where he went, and I thought he went to New Orleans. That's interesting. Ivory Hoover died on November 18, 1917, only a week shy of his 42nd birthday, and only a few weeks after J. Edgar Hoover got his first Justice Department promotion. This was the same year Hoover's official father, Dickerson Hoover, had to resign his government job due to a nervous breakdown. It wasn't his first mental collapse. He'd been in and out of institutions since 1913, when J. Edgar Hoover had come of age at 18. And suspiciously, there were no records on file documenting Ivy's death, due to two subsequent courthouse fires, conspicuously convenient to the time of J. Edgar Hoover's rise to power in the early 20s was the initial fire and then it was uh, later fully destroyed in the 1930s and from what I from what I understand from various accounts the fire was quite mysterious according to the oral history Ivy Hoover was J. Edgar Hoover's biological father through an affair he had had with Annie Hoover who was married at the time to Dickerson Naylor Hoover in Washington DC for when Ivy Hoover's son, J. Edgar Hoover, rose to the Ivy Leagues of Power and looked down from his ivory tower, he couldn't have been very happy because not only was he painfully aware that he'd be killed if anyone found out a secret, his own father had to die so that he could stay there. For Ivy's demise was the first of those two murders in Millie's family committed to keep Hoover's secrets safe. 
And you know, when we came to Mississippi to look for this, I was more inquisitive. I really wanted to know then who was murdered, why they was murdered, so I knew I had to go to Mississippi. Millie first discovered that Ivy had died young at his grave site in Mississippi. Later, she finally found a death certificate, not in Mississippi, but in Washington, D.C. And though it had the correct date of death, November 18, 1917, the cause was blank. This was highly unusual. All other relatives Millie researched had causes listed, even one who died before Ivy in 1914. Ivy Hoover was mysteriously murdered in 1917. At that particular time, J. Edgar Hoover was just beginning his career in the FBI and had just been promoted in the FBI. And the census records revealed that after Ivy's death, Annie ended up back in Washington, D.C. with her husband, Dickerson. The reason why Annie came back was because Ivy mysteriously was killed. And that was part of the secret in the family, that Ivy, there was two murders in our family that made us say that you could never tell that J. Edgar Hoover is related to us. He is passing. This is what was said. He is passing for white. So when she left and went back to Washington, why would she stay? Her lover was killed. The other murder in Millie's family was J. Edgar Hoover's half-sister, Mazzola, who wasn't happy about their father, Ivy's murder. She died 10 years after he did, also at a young age, leaving five babies motherless. Again, mysterious circumstances and no death certificate found anywhere. And since hers was the second murder in the family, no one was even whispering about it. Even today, family members are still affected. Yes, we found him. Think about it. Think about how early the cemetery is. Here's a child who was buried here in 1831. That's very early. Yeah, you know, that's very true. early. Interesting. When you think about it, how many country cemeteries have either of you seen where you have blacks and whites buried in the same cemetery? Not very many. I haven't seen any since we've been here. You've got oh, whites, right. you've got blacks over there. I knew Ivy wouldn't be with the rest of them. Uh, Ebenezer is over there at that, what, Pope Titter? At, with the black uh, people. And I knew they were going to find Ivy there. You got her. This is where Ivy is with the white family. Doesn't that tell you something? As Millie and her researchers discussed the rarity of blacks buried with whites in the early 1800s, the son of Uncle Ivy's only living grandchild showed up. Well, normally, a slave master would not be buried with no. his slave. Mm -hmm. White theory wouldn't be in the same cemetery. They'd have a road to separate them. Daniel Dillon is cautious even today talking about the family secret because his mother, Can, was only five when her mother, Mazzola, was murdered. More proof that the Hoovers and Allens were family came in a deed delivered by mail, sent by an unsolicited member of the Hoover family named Jim Hayes. Millie's grandfather, Clarence Allen, received the land in a deed given to him by his father, William Allen, who got it from his father, William Hoover. I'm sure the whole family loved everybody, and that's, that was something to protect us because, you know what, now we've we got blue eyes and we've got light skin, so let's pass. Maybe we can help the family. I'm sure it was all good intentions and everything was about love and let's do it, but it backfired. It backfired because a lie never is good. And J. Edgar Hoover was forced to live a lie his whole life, believing until his late teens that he was not only a white child but the son of Dickerson Hoover, who apparently hated him. Another clue to Hoover's inner torment came in an obscure little booklet he authored called, If I Had a Son. I wanted to find out something that told me something about the man, about his, even the boy, when he was a little boy. So I got this little book and I started reading it. I felt J. Edgar Hoover in this piece. I know that he was writing for a Sunday school, probably Sunday school class, and he was writing If I Had a Son. And why did he pick that topic? If I had a son. He didn't have a son. He never wanted a son. He never even wanted a wife. I, I read that much about his autobiography to find that out. When I read this, the first thing he said was, if I had a son, I'd probably be frightened. That was deep. That was deep to me. Then one thing stuck out in this piece with me was he said, if I had a son, I swear to do one thing I'd never tell him a lie. 
I'd always tell him the truth. And that then made me know that I'd found the truth in my family. The truth was that as horrible as J. Edgar Hoover would become to black America, he was in the beginning at least a victim himself. Because the, the uh, white father that he was raised by didn't, didn't accept J. Edgar Hoover. And he said that many times, that my mother is my everything. His mother raised him. And I feel like in this pamphlet he was trying to tell us that he was being abused. He was being abused by this man because he found out that his mother had an affair and he wasn't his son. And I think that all his life he was abused because I think that when he was older he was told the truth and I, I believe that. He was told the truth and he had to carry that lie, the same lie I had to carry. Millie's own family was not happy with what she had done. Family members got together and they were very angry, they were very upset about Millie writing this book. They felt that she had no right to dig up the dead. Millie's research rattled some skeletons in her family's closet, far more shocking to them than being related to J. Edgar Hoover. You see, the thing that I think was the biggest secret was the incest in the family. Millie's kinship chart exposed a family tree with almost every branch intertwined and twisted. For instance, Millie and her siblings are all half-fourth cousins, too and their mother is also their half-third cousin once removed. And even though Big Daddy predicted it... When they are, these bones will come out the closet. No one in Millie's family was thrilled to see her shining a light into the darkness. And they oftentimes assumed it might be something negative, so many were very, very unsupportive, and some extremely hostile and threatening. As painful as it was to examine, Millie needed to dig deep to free herself. After seven years, even after three years of research, with all of these boxes and garage full of research and going through it, all I wanted was the truth. That's all I wanted. I wanted the truth to set myself free, to get over whatever it was I was suppressing in my memory, to get it all out. I've unveiled the pain inside of me through the help of loving people that cared about that pain, saw that pain, didn't even know me. Call them on the phone and said, I need your help and I'll pay you to help me. I hurt so bad inside for so many years. And not only that, I was abused by so many people because I had no memory of my childhood. And I wondered why people were so hard on me and wasn't showing me the love that I think a child should have had. So I grew up with all that pain. So for a long time I thought it was because they just didn't like me because I was poor. But it wasn't that. It was because the memory that I had buried inside of me was eating at me. And it was a little girl down in there wanting to come out. She wanted to come out and she wanted to tell. She wanted to free the country free the world. It is not about color. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed of who you are. The joy is that those things which are done in darkness will come to light. And I thank God for Miss McGee and her work and those who helped her because it gives us an explanation for why this man hated black people so much, one, and two, why he was a criminal about getting goods on other people and their secrets. My grandfather's spirit is there. And he's proud, he's proud of me, that I had the nerve to go and find my roots and to believe in him and to believe what he told me and to have it deep in my heart. This is where I fell in a ditch and I got up. This is home. I'm here to free my family, free America, free America of the curse that J. Edgar Hoover, my relative, put upon this country. I'm here to say to everybody, we're all free at last. It doesn't matter what color we are. And I would take the first step to say that I forgive you, J. Edgar Hoover. 
Miss McGee Morris has proven to the world that what's done in the dark shall truly come to the light.